This module will introduce black feminism as part of the Feminist Legal Theory and Generation of Rights 2 module. The status of women in society has overwhelmingly always been less than that of men. The status of people of colour in the West has also overwhelmingly been less than that of Caucasian people. The combination of prevalent racism and sexism within society has led to women of colour experiencing double forms of discrimination at the same time. These double, or more, coexisting forms of discrimination led Kimberly Crenshaw to coin the term intersectionality as covered in the previous module. She did this in 1989 to reflect the experience of black American women specifically and women of colour generally in the USA. The combination of racism and male domination of women during slavery within the USA was enacted into legislation as early as 1664. The Anti-Amalgamation Law of Maryland declared that any freeborn woman who shall intermarry with a slave shall serve the masters of such slaves during the life of her husband, and that all the issue, meaning children, of such freeborn women so married shall be slaves as their fathers were. The power to legally change a woman's status from free to slave to serve the masters of such slaves demonstrates how women were not seen as full, equal humans or equal to that of white men, but instead they were seen as property to be controlled, coerced and enslaved. That women's status as slaves was determined by that of their husband's legal status and not that the husband should become free upon marriage to a freeborn woman reinforced women's lesser status to men with their legal identity being dependent upon their husband's status. The basis of black feminism is rooted in the movement for the abolition of slavery. Sojourner Truth, a black woman born into slavery, became one of the most famous 19th century reformers in the black feminist movement. Her speech, delivered in 1851 called Ain't I a Woman, asserts that slave status denied black women motherhood, protection from exploitation and feminine qualities, calling attention to the intersection of race and gender. Truth highlighted the specific experience of black women in America. She claimed she bore children but that they were sold into slavery by the slave owner. She compared the treatment given to white women where they were carried over ditches and helped into carriages and notes that she received none of this attention because of her race. Further, she argued that she has been worked as much as a man because of her skin colour and her reduced status to property to be worked for profit and rendered her gender invisible. During slavery, black women were not only made to work out in the fields and do as much manual labour as the men, but they were also subjected to sexual violence by both the white slave owners and their black male counterparts. In the 1950s, when the feminist movement became more organised and articulated common demands of women, these demands were often the needs of middle-class, white, heterosexual, married women. The dominant demands for women, therefore, did not actually encapsulate or represent the needs of black women within society. In the 1960s, when the black American civil rights movement became significant, it mostly articulated the needs of black men. Women's voices were therefore sidelined, and in some cases they were encouraged to quieten their demands, for example, black women were told first we will get votes for black men and then we will get rights for black women. Therefore, although sexism looms as large as racism as an oppressive force in the lives of black women, black women were often asked to choose between fighting for racial or sex-based equality and not both concurrently. In some cases, there was even pressure for black women to not fight for the rights of other black women and this pressure came from black women themselves as they felt that the need for racial equality was more important and that gender equality in that campaign was only a white women's issue. As black women, their needs were not prioritised in either the mainstream feminist or the black American civil rights movement. Their needs and specific reality received the least attention and subsequent support. In terms of a social hierarchy of privilege in the West, this meant that white men were, and arguably still are, the most privileged. White women were second, black men third, and black women last. Bell Hooks has argued 
that no other group in America has so had their identity socialized out of existence as have black women. When black people are talked about, the focus tends to be on black men. And when women are talked about, the focus tends to be on white women. Hooks further argues that black women and white women's lived experiences have never been the same as each other. Although both groups of women were both subjected to sexist victimization, as victims of racism as well, black women were subjected to oppressions that no white woman was forced to undergo. As radical feminism wants the entire legal system to be rebuilt to accommodate and therefore be representative of women's difference to the male norm, leading black feminist legal theorists want the analytical structures of feminist theory and anti-racial discourse to be rethought and recast. Kimberly Crenshaw believes that due to the double discrimination of both sex and race, the intersectional experience is greater than the sum of racism and sexism combined. An analysis that does not take intersectionality into account cannot sufficiently address the particular manner on which black women are subordinated. Patricia Hill Collins uses the concept of the matrix of domination to support this theory. She argues that two different societal features, male domination as well as the idea of white supremacy, overlap to create situations in which black women face extreme oppression, which are, at times, far more unequal and discriminatory than the prejudicial treatment which white women experience. Black feminism is therefore based on the principle that women of colour experience at least two forms of coexisting disadvantage, that of being a woman and of belonging to a minority race. Combining these two distinguishing characteristics often results in black women experiencing sexism and racism in their pursuit to engage with social institutions and structures. They are therefore more likely to experience a larger number of barriers in their pursuit of equal rights. These barriers, which form obstacles to black women's full and equal participation within society, compound one another, resulting in coloured women's marginalisation and their marginalised position within society unequal, for example, to the position of either white women or coloured men. In 1989, Kimberly Crenshaw wrote a seminal article titled Demarginalising the Intersection of Race and Sex, a Black Feminist Critique of Anti-Discrimination Doctrine, Feminist Theory and Anti-Racist Politics. Within this, Crenshaw suggests that when disadvantage is examined using a single axis framework, for example that of women being unequal to men on the basis of sex alone, it erases black women in the conceptualization, identification and remediation of race and sex discrimination by limiting inquiry to the experience of otherwise privileged members of the group. Crenshaw argued that if an analytical structure to examine sexism within society exists, we must question who created the structure. If white middle-class women devise the structure to explore and critique white men's oppression against them, then the structure will only be able to understand the position of women of colour to the extent that they can conform or become similar to white women socially and economically. Their race, therefore, is not fully recognised as a group upon which they may experience different forms of concurrent discrimination. Further. This analytical framework will not be able to recognise the discrimination women of colour experience as a separate, multi-dimensional lens is needed. Without recognition of intersectional forms of discrimination, coexisting and reinforcing one another, for example, to be discriminated against because of a person's sex, race and potentially religion, level of physical or psychological ability, sexual orientation and others, the framework marginalizes those who are multiply burdened and obscures claims that cannot be understood as resulting from discrete sources of discrimination. A solution is then to adapt an intersectional framework that examines intersectionality and hopes then to be able to recognize harm and propose solutions. Martha Chamalis, in her work, Introduction to Feminist Legal Theory, shows how intersectionality can be understood and actually functions. She states, theorists tried to explain how race, class, sex 
and other factors intersected in multiple ways to create distinctive forms of discrimination for specific subgroups of people. Intersectional feminists insist the traditional focus of anti-discrimination law on discrete, mutually exclusive kinds of discrimination must be re-examined. For example, if the situation of African American women has to be fully addressed, the habit of thinking about women and minorities has to be broken. Such conceptual dichotomies tend to focus attention on white women and black men, subsequently erasing black women from the equation. The case of Emma de Graffin Reed and others versus General Motors Assembly Division from St. Louis that went to the District Court in Missouri in America in 1976 is a good example of both intersectional discrimination and how law, as a social institution, marginalized the experiences of black women by not giving them legal recognition. This case was filed by Emma de Graffin Reed and four other black American women as plaintiffs against their former employer, General Motors. The plaintiffs sought a determination from the court that the termination of their employment contracts as part of the last hired, first fired policy was discriminatory. Their central argument was that the termination of their employment resulting in them, black women, losing their jobs more than white women or black men perpetuated the effect of General Motors' past race and sex-based discrimination. They therefore alleged that this action was a violation of the Title VII of the U.S. Civil Rights Act 1964 provisions. These provisions were a federal law prescribing discrimination in employment on, amongst other factors, race or sex. Before 1970, General Motors employed only one black female. She served as the janitor. General Motors conceded that until the 1st of May 1970, it excluded all women from assembly line work at the plant, except in areas where the women could always be sent home after a nine-hour shift without disrupting production within the plant when it worked longer hours. Pursuant to 1970, General Motors did employ some women in the cushion room where automobile seats and upholstery are produced. However, no black women served as employees in the cushion room. In justification for the almost complete exclusion of women from its production facilities, General Motors stated in its brief that until shortly before employment was open to women in all departments at the production plant, state laws and regulations prohibited the employment of women for more than nine hours per day and prohibited an employer for allowing women to work around moving machinery. General Motors had placed restrictions on the height and weight of its production line employees. This may also have reduced the employment of women as they were less likely to meet the threshold. General Motors began disregarding these state protective laws on or around the 1st of May from 1970. These protective laws, rather than a corrective approach, failed to enable women to fully enjoy human rights on an equal basis with men. For example, the ability to work at times convenient to the individual, access different employment positions within their workforce, regardless of their race or sex, and to seek and be rewarded with financial remuneration within different categories of work with different values accorded to them. General Motors employed one black female employee as a janitor. It then hired six more female employees on the production line in 1970. 11 more in 1971, and 137 in 1973. In late 1973, General Motors employed 155 black women out of approximately 8,500 employees. Immediately before the January 1974 layoffs, the General Motors plant employed 8,561 workers. After the layoff, just over 6,000 workers remained. The layoffs affected most of the workers who joined the production plant before 1968. This included all of General Motors' black women employees except for the one janitor. The population statistics disclose that black women represent nearly 22% of the population in the metropolitan area of St. Louis, and yet they only represented 1.8% of the workforce. This demonstrates that they were just not hired at proportionate values compared to their presence within society. De Graffin Reed argued 
that she applied for employment with General Motors in 1968 and again on the 5th of June 1973 when she was subsequently hired. When hearing the case, the District Court wanted to decide whether the plaintiffs were claiming that they had been discriminated against on the basis of race or sex. The court noted that the plaintiffs allege that they are suing on behalf of black women and that, therefore, this lawsuit attempts to combine two causes of action into a new special subcategory, namely a combination of both racial and sex-based discrimination. The court notes that the plaintiffs have failed to cite any decisions which have stated that black women are a special class to be protected from discrimination. The court's own research also failed to disclose such a decision. The plaintiffs are clearly entitled to a remedy if they have been discriminated against, the court said, but they should not be allowed to combine statutory remedies to create a new super remedy which would give them relief beyond what the drafters of the relevant statute intended. Thus, the lawsuit must be examined to see if it states a cause of action for race discrimination, sex discrimination, or alternatively either, but not a combination of both. The above excerpt from the case demonstrates that the court chose to interpret the intent of the Title VII non-discrimination provisions and that even if two or more grounds listed as grounds on which discrimination was not allowed to be perpetrated existed, for example, race and sex, a super remedy, as the court called it, could not be applied. The court therefore failed to recognize that intersecting forms of discrimination that may disproportionately affect women of color may exist. By not providing recognition of the both and approach that the third generation of feminist legal theory adopts, the court played a role in narrowing and reducing the legal protection available to the plaintiffs. Second, by stating that the plaintiffs should have cited decisions to substantiate their claim and that they are a special class of people, the court placed a burden upon the plaintiffs which doesn't recognize that the Title VII law is relatively new and such case law may not exist. The evidentiary burden is therefore a further obstacle for the plaintiffs in their pursuit of justice. When the court continued its consideration of the special class identity of black women, the court stated, the legislative history surrounding Title VII does not indicate that the goal of the statute was to create a new classification of black women who would have greater standing than, for example, a black male. The prospect of the creation of a new class of protected minorities governed only by the mathematical principles of permutation and combination clearly raises the prospect of opening a hackneyed Pandora's box. The court's resistance to the recognition of the specific situation of black women as opposed to black people where men and women are equal demonstrates a lack of gender-sensitive rights-based justice by referring to the principle of the Title VII provisions as a hackneyed Pandora's box if they were read expansively, the court did not choose to adopt a broad legal protection. This demonstrates its active resistance to recognize the disadvantage of black women and how the court could have served as a tool to further their equality. Patricia Hill Collins, a leading American feminist sociologist, follows Crenshaw's theory of intersectionality and argues that although all African-American women encounter racism, social class differences among African-American women influence how racism is experienced. Hill Collins also references homophobia within the black community to be an added form of discrimination for black American non-heterosexual conforming peoples, and that other factors such as ethnicity, region of the country, urbanization and age will all differently affect a women's lived reality. Hill Collins also cites Galtney's writing that although a man and a woman's mind is the same, the business of living makes women use their minds in ways that men don't even have to think about. Hill Collins therefore claims that as black women will all experience differing forms of discrimination at differing or variable levels, there can be no one black woman standpoint 
but a black women's standpoint can be promoted. To deepen a contextual understanding of black women's experiences, Hill Collins developed four core themes within black feminist ideology. These are 1. Black women empower themselves by creating self-definitions and self-valuations that enable them to establish positive, multiple images and to repel controlling representations of black womanhood. 2. Black women confront and dismantle the overarching and interlocking structure of domination in terms of race, class and gender opposition. 3. Black women intertwine intellectual thought and political activism. And four, that black women recognize a distinct cultural heritage that gives them the energy and skills to resist and transform daily discrimination. The status quo within society is often represented within the media. Hill Collins uses the concept of controlling images to talk about how popular representations of black women are wrought with stereotypes have a significant degree of negativity attached to them and are aimed at reflecting the dominant group's interest in maintaining black women's subordination. Although Collins's work started to be published in the early 1980s, the media often continues to portray women of colour within very narrow stereotypes and thus fails to advance their social equality. Many films, TV shows and advertising campaigns, even in the current day, continue to reinforce stereotypes and not encourage the portrayal of women as equal with each other or equal to men. Reference to American TV serials can help to demonstrate this point. Sex and the City was widely praised as a TV serial to foreground the lives, experiences and frustrations of modern day women in America. And yet, this show did not have any women of colour in any of its leading roles. Desperate Housewives and Modern Family have both cast Latino women as actresses for roles where the characters are dramatic, demanding and overly sexualized in comparison to the roles of women performed by white actresses. The 2017 release of the film Wonder Woman, again an entire production centered on female characters, also failed to be inclusive of diversity. The lead character is Caucasian and black women were only cast in Amazonian roles, roles where the characters were largely defined by their physical strength and only present in the film for the first 20 minutes. Such stereotyping led to significant online criticism of the film and comment writer Cameron Glover stated, connecting black people to brute strength dates back to slave selling auctions where a black person's value was directly linked to how physically fit they were. Glover also stated that Wonder Woman's emphasis on the black Amazon's physical strength and little else, and that they were barely named and only had a handful of speaking roles in the film, is a reflection of these same tired black stereotypes. Such representations of women within law and in the media demonstrates that society still perceives women within narrow frameworks. In order to overcome this, Black feminism demands that women of colour are treated equally with other members of society and are given recognition of their historical and current disadvantage to help achieve this reality. The same experiences that women of colour have had which have been highlighted in this module and how they fight for equality within pre-existing structures that marginalise and discriminate against them has obviously not only been experienced by black American women. The same can be true for Native American women and Latino e One second. The experiences of black American women within this module, where they have to fight against oppression and discrimination from society at large, is obviously not unique to only black American women. The same experiences, frustration and marginalization is common to all minority women, including minorities on the basis of religion and ethnicity, such as Latino Americans and Native Americans. Similarly, outside of the USA, this same pattern of discrimination and marginalization also exists. Within India, caste-based discrimination is often talked about and is in the previous module. The same can also apply for women who belong to minority religions within India 
and minority religions and minority ethnic groups across the world. This module has demonstrated how the feminist movement in the West, from its very inception, has failed to accommodate and represent the different experiences of black women living in the West. From the suffrage movements where the white suffrage lobby aligned themselves with the black women's lobby seeking the right to vote, only to then backturn and claim racial homogeneity with white men after it became clear that aligning themselves with black women did not help to further politically advance their campaign. Two, other generations of feminism that have failed to represent and accommodate the needs of black women's difference and intersecting forms of discrimination. Black women have historically been the most socially disadvantaged group in the West. Today, black women in America continue to be the most overrepresented group within statistics such as underemployed, single parents and living in poverty. Women like Kimberly Crenshaw, who co-founded the African American Policy Forum, in addition to lecturing in universities and at public events, seeks to achieve the active intervention in the political arena to ensure race and women's issues are represented and heard, and she hopes that this will mean that society moves towards a post-racial society, and that this will one day become a reality. Until this is achieved, however, women of colour will continue to be disproportionately affected by disadvantage on the grounds of race, sex and often poverty. This module is now complete. Thank you.